<clears throat> Over the years, drug users are branded as miscreants and unsolicited in society. They are prejudiced as criminals and further stigmatized by the people. Since people view them as criminals, the only solution deemed fit is their imprisonment. However, as we all know it, addiction is a disease and they are to be seen as victims. More discourse on this will help the people and the society. And today we are here to have this discourse on this issue. Keeping all of it in mind today at ICIP India and ICIP Global, we are organizing this webinar on alternatives to imprisonment of drug users. What, what, what are you in it here for? The conference is aimed to discuss and understand the need for alternatives to incarceration for substance users and possible opportunities for interventions along with the dust system. The conference is having global experts who will provide insights into the alternatives at all justice system sectors. The research on the efficacy of treatment for justice involved clients with substance use disorder and a judicial perspective on implementing alternatives to incarceration throughout the justice system. So, uh, we will be interacting with and we'll be having a lot of insights from uh, Miss Melody Heaps, uh, Dr. Igor Kutsinok and uh, Miss Michelle Vorobiek. And uh, let me introduce the panel to, to everybody here. Uh, Miss Melody Heaps is a chair at ISIP. She's the president emeritus at Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities. She's also a president of MMHN Associates and has been a consultant with US Department of State, US Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and National Institute of Justice, National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. Clearly, she will be having a lot of insights that we'll be all uh, taking notes from. Uh, Dr. Igor Kutsinok has a background of psychiatry, where he's a professor of psychiatry at University of California, San Diego. He's a director at Center for Criminality and Addiction, Research and Training, Director, International Addiction Technology Transfer Center at Ukraine, and is also the Vice President of International Consortium of University on Drug Demand Reduction. We welcome you, sir. Apart from her, apart from them, we have Michelle Vorobiek. She's a Justice Consultant, uh, President, National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws, former Pre Vice President and Chief Counsel, Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities, former Ohio Supreme Court Policy Council, former magistrate and acting judge, review board and implementation advisory group, NADCP adult drug court best practice standards. Uh, we welcome you, Michelle, as well. I am sure we all will be learning for, uh, we, we all will be learning a lot from, from the panel today. And of course, anytime you have a question, you can write to us in questions and we will take answers at the end of it, for sure. Uh, Melody, uh, it, uh, you can take over. Okay, thank you, Saban. I want to welcome everyone um, from the Indian ISIP chapter. I am chair of the ISIP board and am very, very excited to be with you today. I only wish we were in person where we could see each other's smiles and watch your heads nod or shake your heads no, and we would have a sense of the mission that we are all in together, which is to reduce drug demand throughout the globe. It is what we I call the hidden epidemic, the epidemic which never ends, and it seems to be at this very, very sensitive time only increasing, and we are all very, very concerned but it is really thrilling to be with you. And I, I wanted to talk to you as well as with Dr. Uh, Kustanok and Michelle Warbach about the issue of alternatives to incarceration. In some ways, the marrying of the interests of the public health and justice system in order to reduce drug demand. And that, that goal is extraordinarily important. While both systems have different lang differing languages, they actually have the same goal, public health and public safety. You cannot have one without the other. They are in fact wedded together. And we have an opportunity as we look at how we develop treatment systems that might be able to intervene and integrate into the justice system to really increase the possibility of public health and public safety. 
what is interesting is if we look at who our population is and look at the dollars that are spent in terms of the criminal justice system, we see this never ending cycle of people who are using drugs whose behavior may lead to criminal activities such as sales, drug sales, possession, property crimes, who end up in the justice system, who go to jail or prison, come out and go back on the streets starting in, in their addiction process all over again. And it's a never ending cycle and a very expensive one, both from a human as well as a financial stand standpoint. The United Nations has said that treatment needs to take precedence over criminal justice prosecution. And I think that's absolutely true. We know, interestingly enough, out of the COVID crisis, that many of countries have had to release individuals from the prisons and jails because of they've become hotbeds for that disease spread, that epidemic spread. And so there's been almost, in some countries, real crises developed by people just being dumped on the street when those people probably didn't need to be there to begin with, had we had treatment interventions all along the justice system. And so let me give you a picture now of what that system would look like from arrest all the way through incarceration and parole. Here it is. What you see here are three sectors and exits all along what I would call being from Chicago and New York in the United States, I call this a subway map. This is a metro map of, of of people when they enter the justice system at the law enforcement side, going all the way through to the final stop, which is incarceration. And in each of these sectors, there are opportunities where integrated treatment can be an exit point for individuals. At the pre-arrest stage with law enforcement, the ability that, and it's happening in some countries now, the ability to intervene with people who are on the street, obviously, exhibiting addictive behaviors, perhaps in an overdose situation, and moving them to treatment without prosecution, without moving them into an arrest situation. The second is the prosecution pretrial stage. The idea that you can look at individuals before they go to court and say, is there a way we might be able to offer treatment at this stage so that we don't have to file charges, we don't have to proceed further. And then, of course, there is the court adjudication stage and the issue of looking at what might be possible so that individuals are not sentenced to prison, but perhaps sentenced to community with treatment interventions involved. And then, unfortunately, we go to the incarceration stage. And if there is not treatment there, that at least when people are re-entering the community from the jails and prisons, there needs to be, again, interventions that allow treatment to be offered to individuals. There are structures which can be put in place, case management structures, diagnostic opportunities, and I think we'll be hearing a lot of them from Michelle Warbuck. But the idea is to see the system of justice, not just one point, but all of the points wherein we are able to integrate treatment into the justice system. And were we to develop a total system, we would dramatically reduce the criminal involvement and the drug demand in our communities and actually build safer and healthier communities. And so I'm thrilled my partners in this particular endeavor, Dr. Kustanov and Michelle Warbeck have been very helpful in all of the work that we've done on alternatives to incarceration. And in fact, the State Department of the United States is developing some training with regard to that. And we're pretty excited about that as well. We'll have opportunities to talk and to, que and to ask, answer questions after that. But right now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kustanov, who really is going to answer the question, well, does this really work? Is, does this really make sense? How can we? What are the results of treatment for criminal justice populations? Dr. Kustanov, please. Thank you. Um, let me just make sure that my slides are, are visible. I hope they are. Uh, okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Good morning, maybe for some of you. I have no idea what time is it for you now, but I, I know it's my time, it's 9 p.m. And uh, it's, I, it's really my pleasure to be with you and to share with you some thoughts that I hope might be helpful in uh, 
our better understanding of what treatment is, what it is not, what it can do, what it cannot do from the clinical perspective. I'm really glad that my partner today is Michelle, who is a professional lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a clinician. So from the legal perspective, this is, I, I, I'm not gonna be talking from the legal perspective, this is not my expertise. Uh, I will be talking from the uh, clinical perspective. And from the clinical point of view, uh, let me first start with the language that we use. Uh, definitely you can call the individuals we are serving offenders, participants, defenders, students, clients, whatever. Uh, I use the term justice involved clients uh, mostly because this is the least stigmatizing terminology I have found. And I think it's quite important for all of us to pay attention to the language that we are using because the language is the expression of our thinking. Uh, and, and so in my, in, in my presentation today, uh, I will be using this terminology, justice involved clients, not addicts, not offenders, not inmates, not none of these things. Um, if you look at the data, the data is very clear. The, there is a direct linkage, the direct relationship between the severity of substance use disorder and the likelihood for the person to end up in in the criminal justice system and particularly in prisons. The more severe the problem is, the more likely for the individual to, uh, to be in prison. Uh, every prison in the world, I mean, even the best prison uh, in the world, there are different prisons, they look differently, some of them look better than others. Even the best prison in the world has incapacitating effect on people, which is just the opposite to what we want to see in addiction treatment in any environment. So the, the uh, prison environment by itself is doing something that is not what we would like to do from the therapeutic perspective. So now we have a conflict number one. Now let's talk about the, what are the goals of treatment intervention in the population? Well, before that, let me say something. In this presentation, I, I'm not discussing people who are just using drugs because the drug use by itself, this is an expression of neurobiological problems that we call substance use disorders. This is a public health issue. This is not public safety issue. These people should not be prosecuted legally. They should be offered effective treatment, available, accessible, affordable, and attractive treatment. I will be focusing on the population of people who have substance use disorders, and they already somewhat are involved in criminal justice enterprise and their life trajectories already has some criminal justice involvement. In other words, people who have already committed something illegal and they have substance use disorders. So let's ask ourselves a question. What is the goal of treatment in, in the criminal justice environment or in the context of criminal justice? Well, the important thing here is Definitely one of the goals is to assist people to reach the stage of sustainable recovery, sustainable remission, and then help them to stay in this remission for as long as possible, which is quite common. It's a typical goal for any addiction treatment program everywhere in the world. Remember, though, we're I'm talking about the population of people who have substance use disorders, and they have already committed some forms of crimes of different severity. If the only goal is to make them, to help them to achieve sobriety and stay in recovery for as long as possible, we might be at risk to create sober criminals, at least a subtype of the population I'm referring to, and that could be even more problematic from the public safety perspective. This leads me to the next question. Folks, please understand me. I'm not trying to challenge anybody's belief system. I'm trying to think out loud with you and with your help. The statement that I just made leads us to another question. And the question is, what is it that we are treating in the population of people who have at least two major sets of problems? They have a substance use disorder with some severity and they have criminal involvement with some severity. So what is it that we are treating? Substance use or maybe something else? Let's discuss it. Let's think together. 
I want you to forget about substance use, prisons, criminal justice system for, for a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll come back to it. I want to use the example of heart attacks. The World Health Organization had done a huge amount of work looking for the risk factors for heart attacks across the globe. And they found that actually there are nine factors that are surprisingly consistent across many cultures, many countries, many different nutrition systems, nine stable factors that actually make people more at risk for heart attack. And the cluster one, meaning there are two factors that we call them cluster one. These are some, sometimes we call them the top risk factors for heart attack. These two factors predict 75% of heart attacks around the world. All of these factors, all, of, all nine of them, are clustered in three groups. The top two are high cholesterol, high blood pressure. The cluster two, smoking, diabetes, obesity, lack of social skills and handling uh, stress. And cluster three, poor nutrition, failure to exercise, and you might be surprised, surprised, no alcohol consumption completely. So these are the factors. Cluster two, cluster three are quite important, but not as important as cluster one. So now here is a hypothetical for you. You have a friend who is over 50, went to the doctor for annual physical. The doctor did the assessment and found all of these nine factors present. This is not uncommon. And the doctor said, okay, listen, you have serious risk factors for heart attack. And here's what I want you to do. You don't eat well, so I want you to start the diet right away. You don't exercise, so you need to start exercising right away. And you are handling stress in a very poor way. So you don't have stress management skills. Here's the phone number, go ahead and call and set up for, uh, sign up for stress management classes. Make sense? Looks like, yes. And a couple of days later, your friend died from a heart attack. Now, the question is what happened? What went wrong? In the physical internal medicine, what happened, we call it as a typical example of a malpractice. Because for some reason, the doctor decided to ignore the science, to ignore the protocol. And the science says, when you have all of these factors present, you go after the first two, the top risk factors for heart attack, put them under control, and then do the rest. So the doctor decided not to do that, and I told you what the result is. Now let's come back to the substance use disorders and criminal justice system. We, as we said, the goal is not just to help people to achieve sobriety and get into remission and recovery. The equally important goal to make is to make sure that as a result of our intervention, people we are working with, justice-involved client will be less likely to commit another crime. Meaning, public safety protection is equally important goal to public health protection by assisting people in getting into recovery. And here is what we know from the science. The two top risk factors for repetitive criminal behavior is not substance use, but criminal thinking, criminal thinking errors, criminal peers, and criminal affiliations. So if we just said, and you agree with me, if you agree with me, that our goal actually is twofold, to protect public health and to protect public safety, then if I'm running a treatment program for justice-involved clients, in addition to the extent and the severity of substance use, I would be very interested what the criminogenic thinking errors are, who are the people my clients are hanging out with? Who are the people they're affiliated with? Because I know from the science, not because I said so, but from the science, I know these are the factors that are critically important. If you agree with me, if we want to protect public safety, in addition to assisting people to get into recovery. There is no single study in the world that would support the idea the criminal justice sanction of any type by itself has any positive impact on human behavior, particularly from the perspective of substance relapse rates reduction and criminal recidivism reduction. There is absolutely no evidence for that, that criminal justice pressure by itself alone can accomplish that. Actually, we have quite a lot of evidence 
suggesting that if you put pressure, criminal justice pressure only, on young people with some subtypes, younger than 25, we actually were making them worse. They will be more likely to continue using drugs and the, the criminal recidivism rates will go up. And it's quite understandable because you, we can actually, using criminal justice pressure, we can suppress a negative behavior or undesirable behavior. We can, we can make people comply, but the compliance will last only as long as you have control over the person with very predictable rebound back to the previous behavior as soon as your control fades. So we don't control people forever. So the suppression by itself has nothing to do with, with behavioral change and change relevant to the recovery from substance use disorders. Uh, if you want to see the data, the data is very clear. Everything that is baseline, this is the baseline of criminality. Everything that is below the baseline, meaning we are making people worse. If we use sanctions only, we are making people worse. The criminal recidivism will go up. Please pay attention to this bar. For years, we used to believe, me included, that the, to the idea that sounds logical, but in science, not everything that makes sense is correct. The idea was that any treatment is better than no treatment. Uh, apparently, if you look at the data, this is not exactly true. Because if the treatment is poorly, if the clients are poorly matched to treatment, or the treatment was delivered without fidelity and quality, if treatment was delivered inappropriately with low dose or low intensity, uh, we are making people worse as well. So this is not just the idea that any treatment is better than no treatment. This is not true. But the good treatment in conjunction with criminal justice system can actually reduce the criminal recidivism by, by more than 30%, which is a huge success if we do it right. In terms of the what, what we have available for justice-involved clients, the, this, is, this line shows a number of different types of interventions in different settings available for justice-involved clients, starting from diversion programs, meaning people who are typically uh, committed nonviolent crime the, for the first time. People can be diverted from the criminal justice system with the assumption and, and refer to treatment with the assumption that the actually therapeutic intervention can take care of the problem. And in many instances, it does. All the way from diversion through probation, through drug courts, through intermediate sanctions, so-called flash incarcerations, not terribly effective intervention, by the way, but it does exist, and that's why I'm mentioning it, all the way to incarceration. So this is the incrementally increase in the intensity of the intervention from the least invasive least intense diversion programs all the way to the most intense, most invasive program type of in, uh, environment, prison, incarceration. Definitely from the perspective of cost, the diversion programs are the cheapest, incarceration is the most expensive. From the public safety perspective, it's just the opposite. When people are in prison, at least I don't have to worry about them, somebody else will. So you do understand that we are serving two masters. We are serving the public budget and we are serving the public safety. And it's really difficult to serve both. You understand what a dilemma we have in our hands when we think about providing services to uh, justice-involved clients. Let's think about something else. I'm talking about the population of people who already have, have committed something illegal. So from the legal perspective, uh, there is a reasonable reason for prosecution and eventually sending them to prison. What if we rely on prisons only? Just send them all to prison simply because they committed crime. We have done it. We have been doing it for decades. And we know what will happen. Again, it's not because I said so. The data is difficult to argue with. Here is what will happen. In three years, most of these people will be rearrested. More than a half of them will end up in prison, and almost all of them will relapse with drugs and alcohol. Doesn't look like a terribly effective idea. Okay. What if we do just the opposite? Since all of these people have substance use disorder, meaning a diagnosable DSM-5 and ICD-11 condition, 
since all of them have a diagnosable condition, what we forget about criminal justice system, and we send them to treatment, all of them. We have tried, and we know the results. Most of these people will never show up even for intake assessment. If we remove completely any kind of pressure, at least initial pressure on them to do that, they won't even show up. Folks, let me share with you a big secret. It's really difficult to treat somebody who is not there. The subgroup of people who will show up for intake assessment most likely will never stay, stay long enough to receive an appropriate dose of treatment. As a result, 12 months later, more than 90% attrition rates. So let me summarize what I just said. In our thinking about interventions for justice-involved clients with substance use disorders, if we apply only public health approach, meaning this is a disease, and there is no question it is, this is a disease, forget about criminal justice pressure, let's do treatment. If we do that, we'll have very high attrition rates. If we use only public safety approach, these are people who committed crimes, so let's respond using criminal justice and law enforcement system. Unfortunately, we'll have very high recidivism. Do you see that neither system, neither therapeutic system alone, nor criminal justice system alone, give us the result that we are looking for? Reduction in substance use disorder, at least decrease in the intensity of it, and getting people, in, assisting people to get into remission and recovery, and public safety protection. Neither of these systems actually give us the result that we want. Okay, well, here is an idea. You will tell me, oh, Igor, you're a smart guy. Okay, what are you offering? Here is what I'm offering. What if we use the best from both systems? What if we use the best from the therapeutic intervention based on science, based on good quality data, and combine the therapeutic interventions with what we have best from the criminal justice system and judicial system? It seems like it makes sense since neither system gives us the result that we want to see. In order for us to answer the question, by the way, I don't know how much time do I have left, and maybe somebody will tell me because I, I have a tendency to carry over and, and take somebody else's time, and I don't want to do that. So if you can give me some sign, that will be nice. So let's take a look at what, how to make this combination of the two systems work. If we really want to make it work, we need to answer four questions. Whom to treat? We cannot help everybody. The second question I partially already answered, what is it that we are treating? How do we do that? Which treatment intervention, which treatment model or combination of treatment models we'll be using? And how well do we do that? Is there any fidelity and quality in what we are doing? In order to answer the first question, we need to measure the risks. In order to select people appropriate, subpopulation appropriate for treatment, using the combination of treatment interventions and criminal justice pressure. We need to measure how likely this individual will commit another crime, and we'll be looking at the number of indicators, the ones that you have this on the slide is just the most common, definitely not the, the full list. We'll be looking at the number of indicators that will give us the result. This, this is the risk score, and usually the assessment systems, the risk assessment is actually quite accurate. You will be able to predict quite accurately with mathematically what exactly is likely to happen from the criminal justice perspective. We already talked about needs. So needs are life attributes that may or may not be linked to criminal, uh, criminal behavior of any type. Uh, we, we work with people who, who are unemployed, homeless, uh, with traumatic experiences in the past, with HIV, with all sorts of mental health issues, with emotional and financial literacy, a bunch of problems, a bunch of different problems. The most common, the most common need in our clients is substance use disorder. So when we have a combination of two variables, there, we have two variables, we have four possible combinations, high, high, low, high, low, 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 high, low. 
So let me tell you, because these are the four different subtypes of population uh, people that we are working with, and they respond very differently to our interventions. High risk and high needs individuals, justice involved clients. Usually these are people who started with delinquency and crime first, usually very early in their life, and then they started using substances and developed most commonly a severe substance use disorder. The substance use chronologically, the onset is later. The delinquency and criminality came first. <clears throat> For this population, we definitely do need uh, some initial criminal justice push through the court, through the prisons, or through the uh, probation, whatever is necessary from the legal perspective. <clears throat> and these clients, they need, do need a lot of good quality treatment. And you will be surprised that this is the population that responds really well when we combine accountability, meaning sanctions, with treatment in a proportion approximately 50-50. This is the population that responds very well to treatment. The low risk and high needs folks, these are people who have severe substance use disorders and their criminality is secondary to the substance use problem. In other words, they would have never committed any crime had they not been severely dependent on drugs and or alcohol. Do they need a criminal justice push? Probably. Does it have to be 50% like in the first group? Unlikely. With a little bit of initial criminal justice push and a lot of good quality treatment, usually long-term residential, these people can do quite well and we will reduce both criminal justice recidivism and drug and alcohol relapse rates. The high risk and low needs of uh, people. Um, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news, these are very few people. This is a very small population. The bad news though, they do not respond well to treatment and they typically commit a lot of repetitive crimes. So these are few people, they cause a lot of trouble. In the previous mental health classifications, we used to call them psychopaths. We don't do it anymore. It's very stigmatizing, but now you got the picture whom I'm talking about. Again, these are very, this is a very small proportion of people, even in prison samples, seven to eight percent. But these are people who can actually ruin your program from the inside if you refer them to treatment. So, but they, from the public safety perspective, they present a significant problem, and that's why they need to be under supervision, criminal justice supervision, as closely as possible for as long as possible. And low risk and low need individuals, I don't know, in, in other countries, in the United States, treatment programs are full with low risk and low needs people because everybody likes them. They're compliant, they graduate, they do everything right, they don't cause any troubles. These are people for whom, as a result of our assessment, we do not have any evidence of severe substance use disorder, neither we have any evidence of severe criminogenic thinking patterns or significant risk factors for criminality. These are people who typically have just got drunk and did something stupid, and now they ended up in criminal justice system. And through this, a half hour to an hour motivational interviewing session, a handshake with friends, and a long conversation with his wife or, 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 or her husband will do it perfectly fine. These are people who do not need treatment. They will be fine anyway. So the two populations that I will be very interested in selecting and referring to treatment are high risk and high needs justice involved clients and low risk high needs justice involved clients. And the last thing I wanna tell you, don't be afraid, I'm not gonna read this slide. This is from the National Institute of Corrections. We have implemented in criminal justice context almost every treatment model that you can think of, and most of them have failed. There are four types of intervention, essentially five. There are five types of interventions that have been found through multiple and rigorous studies, effective for this specific population. The motivational enhancement intervention, so evoking motivation, including motivational interviewing. The use of incentives and sanctions, reinforcing accountability. A variety of cognitive behavioral interventions with specific targets, specifically tailored for people with some form of criminal justice behavior, 
and people with traumatic experiences and many type, other types of problems. And the fourth treatment model is the model that, that mobilizes social supportive network, or we use, we, we call them therapeutic communities. The fifth treatment intervention type that has been consistently found effective, particularly recently, are medication-assisted therapies, particularly for people with opioid use disorders. Unfortunately, we have medication options only for opioids, alcohol, and nicotine. We don't have for anything else. So opioid medication-assisted therapies could be quite effective for a subset of the population we are, we are dealing with. And the last thing I want to tell you before, before I stop, whatever intervention you want to do with justice-involved client, the most effective interventions are behavioral in nature. And behavioral in nature means that we are not just sitting and reading the manual with manualized treatment, and every participant in the group is sleeping and this poor counselor is reading the manual. In our treatment, we give people the opportunities to practice, practice new types of behaviors. And this is one of the best strategies, particularly utilizing some of the cognitive behavioral interventions and motivational interviewing. In therapeutic communities, people practice new behaviors all the time. So the, the, if you look at the data, the non-behavioral interventions are significantly inferior in the effect compared to behavioral interventions. Okay, I have a bunch of data. I'm not going to bother you with evidence. This is the best slide of all, and thank you so much for your attention. I'm really, really privileged uh, getting this opportunity to share with you some thoughts that could, could be of some use to you. Thank you. All right, our thanks have been said, but Dr. Ego, you had 10 more minutes, and uh, if you would like to use them, you can still use them. Uh, I think I'm done. Thank you, though. All right, all right, sure. Melody? Well, I just wanted to say thank you, Igor, because that background is so critical when we look and we're trying to suggest to people that at any point along the justice system, it is important to look at what kinds of treatment, the method of treatment, the nature of the criminal involvement, and it's a complicated process. But one of the things I want to do before we talk about Michelle is what happens when we create this integration of public health and treatment into the justice system is there is new confidence between both. Often the justice system doesn't have confidence in the treatment system. They see people going in and out of treatment, they say it doesn't work. But the more we can effectively integrate and they can see that in fact treatment works, that it does reduce drug addiction, it does change behaviors, it really is a powerful advocate for increasing treatment resources in a country, in a city, in a state, wherever you may be. So Michelle, I would appreciate it if you would take us as a former judge and a lawyer through the justice system and talk to us about some of the intricacies and the primary issues that are involved in this. Thank you. Michelle, we're back. I am glad to do that, Melody. And let me set up my screens. All right, great. Well, um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Um, you know, we've had to learn a lot about technology during COVID. And so my time, it's heading on one o'clock in the morning and I realized how dark this room is. So I tried to set up enough lighting um, that we will be able to um, get through the presentation. And again, I just, it would have been much better to be in person. Um, I always learn so much. And I think that's one of the challenges of Zoom is that the presenters don't have as much of a chance to learn from participants. Um, but I know we have a Q&A session later. Um, so please write down your questions and we can have some good dialogue once the presentations are complete. Um, I always learn things from Igor and I am going to let me get my cursor. Um, and as he mentioned, uh, you know, when you hear the clinical standpoint, it makes so much sense. And I find that when I'm talking to some of my justice colleagues, some of them still say, you know what, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a clinician, I'm a judge, I'm a lawyer, why should I be doing this? Um, and so I think it helps, and you may have colleagues or people in your community that uh, have some hesitation of embracing a treatment alternative to incarceration. 
um, as well as a justice role in that. And so I like to have people look at um, these eight purposes of the court and think about um, which ones actually support doing exactly what we are talking about today. And so if we were in a group, we could start a bit of a conversation. We're not. Um, so I'm going to have you think about that. And I'm going to tell you the top three responses, um, as well as one that I often hear. Um, so really, when you look toward the bottom of the list, um, deterring criminal behavior, so reducing recidivism. Very, very clearly, um, a lot of consensus that that is a purpose of the court. Um, rehabilitating individuals that are convicted of crimes. We want to make sure that when they go back into the community, they're unlikely to commit those crimes. Um, and also community safety. So when we look at providing for the separation of here, uh, it does use some stigmatizing language, but individuals that are involved in the justice system, um, we do want to ensure that when someone encounters the justice system, that they are able to safely return back into the community. Um, and, and Igor did a great job of presenting why our traditional justice system isn't working. Um, my bachelor's degree is in psychology, and so I'm not nearly as smart uh, as he is about um, the theories of behavior modification, but definitely had some good, solid introduction. And when I went to law school, I promptly unlearned everything I was taught as part of a psychology degree, because we were taught that um, if you have someone coming into court, and they violated the community standards that are codified into the law, that the response needs to be to issue punishment. And the punishment needs to be so severe that the individual realized they did something wrong. Um, you're punished for the behavior that you did. And you're also deterred from future illegal conduct. And so I think now, you know, we've saw some compelling statistics and data showing that that's not how we change behavior. It's not how we reduce recidivism, make communities safer or rehabilitate individuals. Um, so now that we've learned um, that what we're doing hasn't been working and that we do need to incorporate treatment, I wanna talk about the multi-system approach that we can look at from a justice standpoint. So here's a slide that Melody showed earlier. And I'm going to go back to it. You don't need to see all the details. I know it, it can be a little bit challenging to read, but I wanna think about the different points in time that we are able to intervene uh, when we're looking at the full spectrum of the justice system, as well as some of the reasons why we want to intervene as early as possible. So when you're looking at this light blue area, that's the pre-arrest stage. Um, one of the biggest benefits of intervening this early if someone does need treatment is that it avoids any kind of an arrest record, any record of charges being filed. It avoids removing someone from their homes and their communities and their employment and it allows them to be directly enrolled into treatment. Um, it's also a benefit because when you are relying and focusing um, the individual intervention on treatment, treatment is really making all the decisions here. Now, as you can imagine, one of the challenges of deflection is that it is voluntary, and so the individuals have to be highly motivated or have some um, good encouragement and motivational interviewing um, to keep them engaged in treatment because you don't have the enforcement that the courts may have. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about deflection later in the presentation. Um, if we do uh, get to a point where we need to bring someone into the justice system, then we have a couple of other opportunities to intervene. Um, one would be at the prosecutorial stage. And again, um, a prosecutor could decide not to move forward with the charges, so there could be a dismissal, or they could do some kind of um, a prosecutorial, prosecutorial diversion intervention, which is usually a pretty brief intervention. Um, it does not use a lot of court resources. It's for the individuals that don't need substantial supervision. And again, it allows the court to focus the rest of the resources on people that really are going to be uh, moving deeper into that system. And one of the benefits here, not only is it not using a lot of those court resources and again, allowing treatment or just that light touch to be the focus, um, but it avoids any kind of a criminal conviction on someone's record, which can certainly interfere with their ability to move on um, in their recovery process. Um, also, as part of criminal proceeding, we have the court. Um, so even if something gets to the judge, um, they have opportunities to avoid conviction, 
uh, with longer, uh, more intensive program, or if we move into the post-sentencing, um, there could be a decision, even if there is a conviction, that we would not require any type of incarceration, um, jail or prison time, as part of the consequence. Um, there, um, although we do have potentially an arrest, a conviction um, on a record, uh, we're not going to remove this individual from society. We are going to make sure that they're well engaged in treatment. And there are some individuals that are not safely maintained in the community, or you may have some laws that require conviction and some type of time served. And so for those individuals, we wanna make sure that we have a robust reentry program that can address their treatment needs as well as those um, you know, social reintegration needs so that they can be successful once they're back in the community. We talk about um, this approach and I, I shared that, you know, a, a number of justice officials will say, I'm not social worker, uh, what, what is my role? And so um, I'm suggesting here that when we have a systemic approach to providing treatment-based interventions, that we have three main systems involved. So obviously we have the justice system. These are individuals that are involved in the justice system. We talked about the full continuum of the justice system um, and the role really is not a clinical role at all. So whether you're law enforcement, prosecutor, judge, or involved in the correction system, um, you would want to identify whether or not someone is eligible for a treatment-based program. Um, oftentimes it has to do with criminal history, uh, with diagnoses and indicator of a need for treatment and taking into account that risk need responsivity model that we just learned about to understand what type of a program would be um, appropriate. Um, generally, the justice system is also going to do um, the supervision. So anytime that there are charges or cases pending, there would be an expectation that the court would oversee that. And then as we learned, accountability um, is really important. It can, uh, once someone voluntarily enters into one of the programs and treatment and other services are a requirement, um, the court really does provide the motivation to make sure that um, individuals are staying on their path and fulfilling the requirements as needed. I would also suggest that the justice system holds the other systems accountable. And so it's important to make sure that um, if you have treatment providers, that they are providing the services um, as needed and expected um, by your programs, as well as those social service providers. Um, the other system that's involved is treatment. Um, and so the treatment providers would be expected to um, have that clinical input. Um, so when the court is deciding whether or not someone really qualifies for a treatment-based intervention, they would need um, clinical assessment with a full uh, diagnosis. So we understand the nature of the problem. Oftentimes substance use disorders are accompanied by mental health um, diagnoses, and so they all have to be treated. Um, the treatment providers would be responsible for making sure we have appropriate levels of care for the amount of time needed to really fully treat the individuals. And we wanna make sure that we are looking at treatment broadly. So it's not simply substance use disorder treatment. We want the behavioral health, so substance use disorder plus mental health. We need medical treatment, um, and we heard about medication-assisted therapies as well as, um, you know, uh, so that would be pharmacological treatment. And then oftentimes there are medical conditions that need to be treated as well. So we wanna make sure that we wrap around these individuals fully so that they have the best chance at recovery. And then we also know that there are some things happening in the community. So there may be instability of housing um, or income. We may need support around education or parenting or family resources or things as simple as transportation so that um, individuals can get to the services that are needed. And we learned a lot about that risk for recidivism uh, and kind of the um, thinking strategies that are required. So some of those would have a clinical intervention and some of those may be supported in the community. So when you set up one of these programs, you wanna make sure that all of these systems are working well together. Then of course you need to know where the individuals fall um, in the risk and need quadrant. And so I, I built this out a little bit more. It's essentially exactly what we just learned about. So someone who's high risk and high need, um, there's a high need for supervision. Um, we clearly have a high need for treatment. And those individuals are likely to have um, a need of the thinking strategies and the life skills that I mentioned before. Um, then if we have someone who has a high need for treatment, but not a high risk for recidivism, 
we're not going to have as much of an emphasis on supervision. Um, sometimes that happens until the individuals are engaged in their treatment program. Um, and after that, the supervision can back off a little bit and become secondary. Um, we definitely have an emphasis on treatment. Uh, we may need some life skills accompanying that treatment. Again, those individual assessments will help us determine what's needed. And there may be some thinking strategies that need to be addressed as identified. We heard about the low risk, low need individuals. And so um, I would agree, I do see a lot of these um, individuals that are involved in the justice system participating in a more robust program. I would suggest that not only um, isn't it needed, but sometimes it can actually be harmful. If someone is over supervised or required to comply with more requirements and what they need, it can actually interfere with their ability to move forward and proceed in the recovery. So again, um, some kind of a prevention um, and diversion program would be very appropriate here. And again, um, the, uh, where there's a low need for treatment, um, again, that by definition is really not going to be the focus area for a treatment-based intervention. And those are individuals who do have a high need for supervision. And so those are going to be some more of your typical court cases and generally are not going to be making use of the programs that we're talking about today. So what else do we wanna think about? Um, one of the questions arises, you know, like what can we expect over time? So um, I will go ahead and populate all of the fields of this slide. And so it's important to be realistic. Now, individuals that are entering the justice system may not be fully on the left and experiencing um, some of the challenges that we see in that yellow column. Um, so I, I want to state uh, that right up front, we may see people more in the green zone or even in the blue zone that happen to encounter the justice system. But if you do have individuals that have some degree of instability and a high need for treatment, um, it may take a full one to 12 months before we see them starting to exercise some of the things that we would expect to see, that they have more abstinent friends, um, that we have a reduction, not an elimination, but a reduction in some of the illegal um, activities um, that would lead to incarceration, that we're seeing less homelessness or victimization and less use of the substance at work or other settings. Um, but we may not be able to expect virtual elimination at that point because this is something that takes time. Um, so as you can imagine, during those first 12 months, we're going to have, if justice is involved, if this is a case that has a high likelihood of recidivism, we're going to have a lot of supervision, we're going to have a lot of treatment, we may have a lot of social services involved to make sure that we can gain that initial stability. Then, um, when we're looking at longevity of recovery, the one to three years is when we're shifting. And we're really achieving a lot of the things that the justice system is expecting. When we look to the purposes of the courts, we don't want to have um, continuing illegal activity. We would like to see some stability in housing. We would like to see legal income and employment. Um, so we're going to hit that somewhere around the one to three year mark. But that's not the end of the road to recovery. Um, really people that are, um, less likely to relapse um, need to have a, a, around five years um, of this solid process. So years four to seven, we're going to rely a lot more on um, social supports. Um, and I'm going to introduce the topic of case management and so that can be helpful. Um, and then also we see that individuals when they're in the yellow zone, they may need an awful lot of support. Um, they're in a period of crisis. Um, they, they need someone to help them um, understand and prioritize what the needs are and how to have them met. By the time they're in that blue category, they're fairly self-sufficient. And typically, if they're running into some issues, they know where to go in the community to get the support that they need. So this slide is going to introduce a concept that um, may or may not be present. Um, but I would suggest that this is another system that needs to be developed to support this multi-system approach. It's specialized case management. Um, so the role here is that within treatment, the specialized case manager is able to focus on matching the clients that we're working with, those justice involved individuals uh, with the needs and levels of care, regardless of whether or not one particular treatment agency can meet all of those needs. So case management might be need to connect an individual to treatment services in more than one location to make sure that the services are fully provided. They also work within the justice system 
to make sure that whatever the expectations are of the justice programs um, are understood by the client and help the clients navigate to successfully fulfill those conditions. They work between the programs for an individual that is encountering the justice system with a substance use disorder in need of treatment. Um, it can be pretty daunting to navigate the treatment system um, on their own and the justice system. There's also plenty of opportunities where they might fall through the cracks. And so a specialized case management system is going to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we have warm handoffs. So rather than giving someone a list of names to call and have them navigate appointments, um, that they're going to be there hand by hand, calling and making the appointments, helping um, the individuals uh, make sure that they have transportation, that they have enough time to get from one appointment to the other, that they're removing any barriers to participation in the services that are expected. And really just being side by side with that client, being their advocate, breaking things down into simple doable steps and ensuring in the end that the client can then have leadership and achieve that social integration that again is part of the purpose of the courts and, and what we would want for the individuals that we're working with. So there are different ways of depicting the um, specialized case management model. Oftentimes we show a bridge and we have justice system at one side, we have treatment at the other, and then we have the community underneath the bridge. Um, I'm showing you this model because I really think it picks up the dynamic nature of specialized case management. And this is a model um, developed by TASC. And as you already heard in our introductions, um, Melody Heaps is our founder. I was um, not able to work uh, at TASC when she was there, um, but uh, was able to be with the agency for a number of years. And um, this case management model is actually part of the foundation of drug courts. Um, so when you look at how staffings and treatment teams function, you will see that they incorporate this um, case management system, um, but it exists on its own and can and needs to be applied in any type of multi-system alternative to incarceration. So kind of walking through this, you're going to hear some of the concepts that Igor already described to us. Um, we have an identification by the justice system that someone may be in need of these services. Um, the court may or may not do a brief screening um, that generally sorts out who might have a treatment need. Um, it does not need to be done by a clinician. So oftentimes the court can handle that responsibility. Um, then they would refer the individual to a specialized case manager who would assure that there is a clinical assessment that would give us all the relevant diagnoses that need treatment. Um, they would also look into the risk needs responsivity uh, types of factors um, so that we understand client strengths, what their needs are, and what other services may be required. Um, based upon those clinical assessments and the skills and strengths and needs, um, then the specialized case manager will be able to make recommendations about appropriateness for some of these justice programs, um, as well as the types of services that would be required. Um, once a person is admitted to a program, then the case manager is going to make all of those service, not just referrals, but also linkages and make sure that the um, individuals are firmly placed into the services and that they're prioritized. The last thing we want to do is overwhelm someone with every single requirement that they need to accomplish all at once. Um, and so the case manager is going to be skilled in understanding when we're going to work on certain goals and which ones are going to come later in the process. And then they're going to keep in touch with everyone who's providing services to the client and keep in touch with the client to see how things are going. And you can see that blue arrow reminds us that this is not a linear process. Um, just like going to the doctor, they're going to evaluate how well the treatment plan is working and make modifications. And so that happens with the case manager. Um, sometimes we need a higher level of treatment than what was indicated. Sometimes once we start working on the substance use disorder, we say that there are other diagnoses that are surfacing. So this is again, a process where there's give and take between the stakeholders working with the client, but we were going to stay on top of that and um, be an ally with the client as they navigate um, the, the recovery process for the treatment as well as their stability and reintegration into the community. And then after we work through that process, um, we have the successful completion of the program. And throughout all of this, it's important to have education and advocacy, making sure that the clients are well-educated, the individuals involved in the justice system understand what the expectations are and how to advocate for themselves. 
educating the different systems, uh, making sure that if there's not compliance in a justice program, that there's a clinically appropriate response, um, that it's not a punitive response, and advocating where there are missing resources. So generally, the case managers are um, closely in touch with all of the treatment and service providers in a community and where there is a need for more, um, they do a great job of being able to advocate for where some of the gaps are in the system that need to be addressed. I'm also going to show you a little bit of data um, because I, you know, as we started to see um, the advent of alternatives to incarceration and judges and, and other justice decision makers started adopting them, um, they got the general message that it was important to refer someone to treatment. And so I'm going to make the case that you need treatment plus case management to have the best result. So if you look at the gray bars on the left, um, you can see that this data represents all the individuals who were referred from the justice system to treatment with or without case management. So that's the whole group of individuals. And overall, when we had that referral, we expected the treatment completion rate to be about 47% in adults and 42% in youth. If we pulled out from that group, the individuals that had the case management in addition to their treatment, um, you can see the substantial increase in the percentage of people that fully completed their treatment. It was 77% for the adults and 82% for the youth. So again, I think um, usually by this time in the room, people it, it makes sense and there are lots of questions about case management because it does not tend to exist independently. Um, it seems um, to be clear how helpful case management can be. And again, the numbers demonstrate that we're much more likely to have a better treatment result when we have case management employed. So a couple things to kind of summarize some of the things we're going for with our justice interventions. Um, the World Health Organization and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime have summarized nicely that really when we have a substance use disorder, it needs to be treated as a health problem. Um, and that should be treated in the healthcare system rather than in a court system. We also have a reminder that when individuals enter the justice system um, for not only drug possession, but also low level crimes that are used to finance the drugs. So once they have treatment, we really typically see the behavior stop um, that brought them into the court system. And we do need that close collaboration. We're not expecting judges to be social workers or treatment providers, but we are expecting the courts to identify individuals that are in need of this more robust and more successful um, approach and make sure that they are linked to the professionals that have that training. The other thing that is really important is a concept of proportionality. Um, here we wanna make sure that the seriousness of the offense and the severity of punishment are in alignment and also that we're really only doing the minimum level needed to protect society. And again, when you go back to the goals of, of the court and the purposes of the court, we don't want to use resources of the court or our correction system to punish individuals when it's most likely going to make them worse we have data that shows even three days of incarceration can significantly increase your risk of recidivism moving forward. And we've already talked about the collateral consequences and the removal from your family and your home and your employment. We also wanna make sure that we have a suitable type of supervision and treatment. And so when we look at those quadrants that were discussed, the uh, risk for recidivism and the need for treatment that allows us to accomplish this part of proportionality and again, making sure that noncompliance is looked at as we need more time for treatment and services to be effective rather than something that needs to be addressed in a punitive manner. And I will um, then in the last few minutes that we have before we open this up to questions and answers, I wanna make this a little bit more tangible. So Igor already had the slide that talks about um, a continuum. This is in a little bit different order. Um, but what we're going to see at the prevention side of things, we're really looking at low risk, low need, and I'm going to share just a few um, components of what you might see in a prosecutorial diversion program. Community supervision, again, these are the individuals that don't really have the treatment need, and so these are sort of our typical justice clients. The community treatment clients are those that don't particularly have a high risk for recidivism, but we do need to make sure that they're well engaged in treatment. High risk, high need, 
uh, really it's all hands on deck. So they are likely to be involved in some type of a robust model like a drug court or perhaps even engaged in residential treatment. And then finally, due to public safety concerns or potential legal restrictions, we are going to have some people that will serve time in incarceration, but upon release, we wanna make sure that we have a robust re-entry program. So let's just take a brief look at some of the components of these various approaches. And it's not that one approach is better than the other. Um, really what you want to have is a few that complement each other well. Um, if all you have is prosecutorial diversion and people feel like they want clients to be assisted, then they're going to be put into prosecutorial diversion, whether or not it's a good fit. The same thing can be said for drug courts or some of the other interventions. So you do want to have some complementary approaches um, you may not be able to have that right away, but that would be what you're aiming for. So you wanna keep that in the back of your mind. So deflection again, is where law enforcement will identify that there's an opportunity to engage an individual in treatment rather than going to the court. Um, they have tight partnerships with treatment providers as well as community service providers. And so they are able to um, accept individuals that are self-referral, um, I think uh, police departments and first responders have been surprised that once the public realizes that this can be a way of entering into treatment, that individuals will approach and volunteer and ask for that assistance. Um, it could be active outreach. It may be known that there are certain families or parts of the community that may be in this need. Um, and so first responders can go and offer to link people to treatment. It could be after uh, responding to an overdose, uh, particularly one that involves opioids even if opioids weren't the primary substance of abuse, now that we have fentanyl, lacing, a number of other substances, this is actually needing to have a broader application. Um, but there is a way for law enforcement and a team of um, others to remain engaged with the family to encourage um, engagement into treatment. Um, officer prevention would be an officer, while they're on their duty, noticing behavior that might be indicative of a substance use disorder in need of treatment. Um, not illegal behavior, but again, an opportunity to make that referral before someone would need to be involved in the court system. And then there is officer intervention, where there could be some of those low-level crimes going on, and there's an agreement with the courts and the prosecutor that first um, deflection would be attempted um, to give an opportunity for someone to engage in treatment without any court record. We talked about prosecutorial diversion. Again, it tends to be the low risk, low need quadrant. Um, pretty quick and short time in the justice system. Um, you can see here that with qualifications, it tends to be some of the low level crimes. Um, sometimes there's a stipulation that it would be a first time offender, um, but you would wanna make sure that they are not in high need for treatment. Otherwise this um, intervention would be disappointing because it's not meeting um, the needs of the individual. Oftentimes there are some general court conditions, uh, an expectation that they're not going to be returning to court. Um, if there was any um, crime uh, property that would require restitution, that that would be expected. And again, to the extent that there are treatment needs that those would be addressed. Um, high risk, high need. Um, many people are familiar with the drug court model. I'm not going to go into depth in terms of what that model looks like, uh, but I do have this slide here as a reminder that treatment courts um, can be used not only for substances, but for a variety of other issues that you see up here on the slide. This model, it's called the designated program. It's really that task model. So relying very heavily on an agency that does that specialized case management in the community to link the individual to identify what the needs are, to link the individual to those needs and then report back to the court when the program has been fully completed. And generally the requirement for this would be some kind of a substance use disorder in need of treatment. Um, oftentimes there is a um, requirement of a nexus between the substance use disorder and the charges. Um, and also that the individual would qualify for probation. Um, in the state of Illinois, it's actually um, protected under law. So an individual has a right to elect treatment instead of going to prison as long as they qualify for this particular program. And we've already talked about what the model looks like. So they would have that intensive specialized case management and upon successful completion, qualified charges could be dismissed um, or if they couldn't be dismissed, there would not be any prison time imposed. 
And then reentry. There are a number of versions, so I gave you some examples on this slide of components for um, a reentry program. Uh, this is actually something TASC also did some work, a, a corrections transition program, where a case manager is assigned uh, while the individual is still in prison and prior to release. Um, at times, treatment can be initiated, um, both behavioral health treatment as well as medication-assisted therapy before the release. And then with that full plan in place, the individual is transitioned into the community, into the appropriate housing, into the treatment and social services that are needed. And they would continue on with a community-based case manager that again would continue the partnership until they reach that level of stability and independence that sets them up for success. So I hope that uh, this was a lot of information to share. We do a number of in-depth trainings so you can learn a lot more details about this. Um, but I hope that you were able to um, learn some new things, um, maybe have some good arguments that you can use to advocate that this um, approach be used in your community and also that you're inspired to take action. And so at this point, I will quit sharing my screen if I remember how to do that. Um, and turn this back over to, I think, Melody. Thank you, Michelle, very, very much. Thank you, Igor. I mean, wonderful. Uh, again, to everyone else, I want to reiterate that Igor and Michelle have been leaders in the development of understanding the need to provide treatment within the criminal justice system and to move people along. Um, I know we need to get to questions, but I want to, I want to talk about an anecdote, if you don't mind. When um, Michelle talked about the specialized case management, it, we're talking about, remember, two systems that have different languages, and they think they have different goals. And what a specialized case management does, however it is located, is it becomes the active translator. It is able to translate the language of the clinician into the justice system. It is able to do vice versa. It's also able to remind the client of the need to comply, to participate while that case management system is doing everything it can to support it. When I started TASC, I, Chicago is obviously a huge urban area, but the state is very rural. And I went downstate to the more rural area and I met with the sheriff who literally ran the justice system. And he did not want our program there. He was going to fight every tooth and nail. And I thought, I held my breath and I went to meet with him. And he was like meeting with a Western cowboy. He had his guns out. He had his, his, his cowboy hat on the thing. And he said, what is a big city lady like you coming in to tell me what to do and put these people out on the street? And I explained what we were going to do and that we would promise that we would be effective and truthful and that if anyone failed in their treatment we would come back to court and say they failed they did not comply and unfortunately they would then be sanctioned he said i don't believe you and i said sir if you if if you if we fail to do that you can shut us down well the first time that i did that he called me he said i don't believe it and then the more he saw that we were doing what we needed to do, he became politically the most powerful sponsor for increased treatment in the state of Illinois. So I'm saying to you that not only are we saving lives for looking at this integration of treatment into the justice system, we also are expanding a political base to advocate for more treatment. So with that, Siobhan, are, are we going to take questions now? Absolutely, absolutely, we'll be having some questions. We have got a good list of questions here. Uh, people have asked questions and I look forward to passing them on to you. Okay, uh, so the first question is for uh, Dr. Igor, uh, which is uh, most justice involved clients, especially in Asia, they do not involve in criminal activity. They were caught because of drug possession for their pers personal consumption. Is this type of client also having uh, problems of SUD and a criminal thought? Okay. Uh, well, to, to make it simple, no. Uh, substance use in general, drug use, is, as we said several times, Michelle and myself and Melody, 
it should be uh, should see a public health response not criminal justice response but let me give you a briefly let me give you a hypothetical everybody every participant put aside substance use put criminal justice think about uh, you know that there is a disease diabetes well let's think about diabetes you found a person in a possession of insulin and the insulin is homemade manufactured at home for the purpose of selling this insulin to other people with diabetes who cannot afford buy, to buy it normally. Are you going to treat this person for diabetes since he doesn't have or she any diabetes? He just manufactures for the, with the intent to sell it. Well, this is illegal bypassing all the safety procedures, bypassing all the quality assurance. This is clearly illegal. So in this, in this case, you will involve criminal justice system at some point. If the person is manufacturing insulin because the person has diabetes and cannot afford normal treatment, so what is the point of using criminal justice system? Let's just make treatment available to this person, increase the, 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 the intensity of it, make, make this treatment affordable, and the person will stop manufacturing, manufacturing insulin in his own kitchen. You see that there, these are two different components at all. All right, all right. Uh, the other question that we have is, uh, what can community-based organizations can do uh, to facilitate this process and to be able to communicate that there's a need to look for alternatives and perhaps look in that direction in, in, in its entirety? Why don't we ask Michelle to respond to that and I may as well, and you too, Igor, let's quickly answer that question. Sure, I, I think to get something like this going, you wanna have a steering committee and you wanna have all the stakeholders that are needed to make this successful. And you've heard all kinds of components. So you can imagine who you need at the table. Not everyone will show up at first. Oftentimes the judge is effective in calling the meeting because when a judge asks you, please attend this meeting, magically people show up. Um, and then you build from that base. And so I think you have, and, and so it can be led by treatment. Sometimes treatment is really pushing for the judge to do this. Um, but someone needs to have the motivation to get it started, to start collecting people on the team. And then again, and, and you know, oftentimes education. Um, so making sure that they have information like this to get them motivated, to buy in, to continue to build the team, and then you can start making the program. I would agree with Michelle. There is information out there that might help the judge, the criminal justice system, understand why this is a good idea. In addition, it's very important that people, when they do sit down together, they literally set up the protocols. They're very honest. I remember sitting down with our judge and our probation officer saying, from the minute a client walks in the door or a minute a, an offender in their mind walks in the court and says he's an addict, what happens? and to come to agreement on what is done, what the communication patterns are, what the rules are, are very, very important. Igor, any comments? I agree with, uh, with everything you said. One of the effective strategies, in my experience, in the United States and in many other countries, is as a first step or first two steps, is to do a cross-training for, for the leadership of every organization involved and for practitioners who will be actually doing the job mm -hmm. to get them together for a couple of days for joint problem solving for different scenario building these are not just different people these are different cultures they use different they have different belief systems they use different language and everything makes rational it's not that one group is wrong another group is right they have the rationale for their activities for their actions and for their decision making processes so they, it will be critically important to put them together, to problem solve together, and to at least dispel the mythologies between each other, because they all have all sorts of mythologies and mythological, mystical mm -hmm. thinking about why people are doing certain things. And, and when we have mythologies, we start building some real misperception, misunderstandings. Very good. Yeah. All right. It's interesting that we talk about training and, you know, uh, making people aware about it. So a question here is, uh, is there any sort of training for professionals on this topic? Like if I have to go for a training or perhaps want to learn more about the models that we're looking at, is, is there any 
anything standard document or anything that we can look and read and learn more or is it something that's still in progress and in development the answer is yes to all of the above ish <laughs> it is something which is in progress um, there is a training that has been sponsored by the United States State Department International Narcotics and Law Enforcement and the Colombo Plan. Um, actually, Michelle and Igor have been involved with it, and it is just beginning to get legs and move beyond a few countries, particularly in South America. In addition, as chair of ISIP, I have been in conversations with our staff and we're hoping that we will be able to, in the next few months, develop a network of justice uh, for justice and treatment in which information and training may be available. So um, be patient. Uh, if there are issues, I think we, as ISIP and I will be happy to work with the India chapter to talk about what might be possible over the next year or two. Uh, and I'm very excited that you are already interested in this topic. It's wonderful. Thank you. Let, 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 let me add something to that. There are tons of different trainings for different groups with different targets and different tasks. Uh, all of these things are available. Most of them are for free. You can use them. The issue here in my mind is training is a necessary but not sufficient step. Mm -hmm. If nothing follows, if you just train people and then stop, uh, the result, people usually feel good, but making people feel good is not the outcome, uh, the only outcome I'm looking for. Uh, people feel good, but all the, everything that you accomplish through this training is likely to die within the next couple of hours, not even days, when they go back to their work. So any training, whatever training you would like to do, should be, fo if you really want to change the practice, should be followed by coaching, mentoring, implementation assistance, fidelity measurements, making sure that everything that you accomplish through the training is actually practically implemented. The prison wardens are not going to implement anything. But because this is a paramilitary system, if you don't have a buy-in from the top, forget about it. Okay? So start yeah. with being very gentle to the wardens, directors, and then go down to the practitioners and then mentor them how to implement it correctly. Igor, I'm so glad you said that. That is 100% the correct approach. The work that we're doing is not just education. It is actually technical assistance, helping people plan. What are you doing differently? What do you want to do? How does this fit? What things are needed? What support do you need? So I totally agree with you. It is not you know, put people in a classroom, you're not going to get anything. Put people in a classroom to look at their own attitudes, to think about the issue, and then sit down and say, okay, this is our problem, this is our system, what do we want to do, what do we need to do it, and to continue to go back and forth with them is very important. Thank you, Igor, for that. Thank you. And, and absolutely, reaching out to people that know a lot about system development and system design. So, you know, you don't want to solve a problem that you don't have. Um, right. You want to understand what your problem is and how to sign it and what science says about how to sign it. So um, yeah. I've seen judges that have an idea that they would really like to have people check into court every single morning because I want to be their encourager. And, you know, the science doesn't show that that's helpful. That's a really tough thing to do. So um, just encourage you. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, so everything that was said before, along with the action planning, and then having some of the experts pinpoint if things don't go well, um, someone can probably from the outside that is used to doing this work very quickly identify what some of those stumbling points are and, and get the program back on the right direction. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So this is the you know the training for professionals that we're talking about. And let's talk about the general public. Uh, what is their reaction to all of this? I mean, Miss Melody has just uh, uh, told us of an experience of hers. Uh, how, at, at, in a very generalized sense, and uh, in a very generalized sense, what is the reaction of the public uh, about this issue? And how do the politicians and other officials who you know they go on about the needs for alternatives here? Michelle, Igor, and I'll be happy. I'll jump in. Any? I'll jump in and start um, because judges are elected, and so 
if the public doesn't like what you do, you're not going to have a job and your effort that you are trying to do could die. Um, so it's a huge um, issue. You have to have buy-in. And, and I'll share what yep. we've done in statewide efforts. Um, it does start with some education. The level of education for the public looks a little different than what you would do with your you know, treatment and your justice practitioners. But at the end of the day, I think what people find most helpful is that there is a neuroscience of addiction. Yeah. And so when we look at how, and we didn't get into that today, but that is part of all of our training programs. It is absolutely the foundation. Um, and when you look at how the brain acts um, and, and how it is impacted by substances, you can get away from the stigma or the blaming they shouldn't have used a substance or they should just quit. And, and, and so the neuroscience of addiction, um, looking at the science about what can be effective. I think what we've also found in the United States is more and more people are afflicted by substance use disorders and there's a personal tie to individuals, including individuals who have died of a substance use disorder. The public is a little bit more open to some of those conversations, um, but the science I think really does have to be part of that initial messaging. And the data. Yeah. For, for the public, uh, as soon as you can, in, in a logical way, reassure them that as a result of what we are doing, they will live in safer local communities, that will do it. Because people are looking for safety. I'm looking for safety. You do too. Everybody is looking for safety. Mm -hmm. It's a normal uh, public education in local communities, not through the mass media going back to the local people that that helps for the political level or people who are decision makers you know there is a good and common sense message that is totally accurate this is the the type of human activity in which doing nothing will cost you much more than doing something and all of the policy makers forgive me guys this they're mostly concerned about how to get reelected well if you can show them a way that is meaningful and powerful and legal and economically viable way to get reelected by saying, well, if somebody is paying for what you're having in the community anyway, so let's invest something and pay less than we are paying right now, and that will make sense and will protect public safety. Usually the policymakers respond positively to that. The concept it also helps to, oh, to have some success stories. Yes. And yes. so, um, to see successful programs, to see, you know, when you have the picture of someone who first encounters the court, you know, the mugshot versus when they complete a program successfully, there are times that I can't even recognize the person who's completed the program from the day that we first had them enter into the court system. And so, you know, having the police officers who arrested them initially, see them and see the success. Sometimes there are treatment providers that are frustrated that they haven't yeah. understood how to wrap around individuals that are involved in the justice system. So when you see success, that's pretty undeniable. The summary is if, it's, if it saves money, if it makes us safer, and if there are human faces attached to it that show they've saved lives, it's a very successful message. And politicians, want to be able to talk about those messages so it, it it works yeah at one point i also think between the public and the professionals you know to bridge that gap the media plays a bigger role and they have to be sensitized enough they they also have to be empowered so that they can also talk about these issues in the most empathic and in the most uh right way uh that's 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 definitely there and right. so the, the treatment programs need also, or whatever program is doing that, needs to keep data. They need to be truthful yeah. about the results. They Absolutely. cannot lie. It's like, this is what we're doing, and the, it this is what the data says, and it's looking good. Yeah. All right. So apart from US, do we have any other countries where uh, you know these concepts are in, being implemented, and you know the call, and there is a demonstration site or anything, and where you can see the impact of uh, the these concepts? Are there any other uh, countries apart from the US where this is happening? 
some work is being done in the United Kingdom, and Igor, you might know that. There is some work now, Chile is taking, it. we just worked in, in Chile. Um, there was some work in Jamaica. Um, Igor, I don't know. Oh, what, what, kind, what kind of work? Developing treatment? Kind of and setting up alternatives to incarceration well, in, 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 in many countries. Very good. I was, I, I was involved in assisting the uh, prison system and criminal justice system in Nigeria, building okay. their programs in Africa. In Latin America, this is in Argentina, Chile, uh, it's actually in Peru, Brazil, this is something that's been going on for many years. In most country, in countries in Western Europe, uh, lots of good examples of good practices. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have done quite a lot of work in designing these programs in, the, in, the, in Thailand, in the Philippines, so actually, this is pretty. This this process is not new. What may be new is it's is it often becomes program oriented as opposed to system oriented. What we're well, trying to what we've tried to do is say think of it as a system. You start at one place in the system. You may start at the prosecution or the law enforcement or even in the prison, but you look at the whole system and see how can we build interventions all along the way over the years, and that's. Uh -huh. And I and I would suggest you to to uh, to pay attention to the work the UNODC yes. uh, colleagues are doing there because they're doing it globally and they're they're doing this work quite successfully for a long time. They have learned quite a lot of lessons that could be very helpful to all of you. And and they actually are working with us on this training and I think it'll come through when we do the the ISIP website part of it. So good. All right. That was the last question. Now I can open the floor for the last comments here. I just am thrilled. I am so thrilled to be a part of this and so thrilled to be a part of ISIP India. And I so wish we could see the faces of everyone there and the smiles or the nose or the just the interchange. It, it really hurts not to be able to do that. But I'm hoping in the next few years we will be able to do that. And I, I thank you all, and I particularly thank um, you, Sivan, and you, Michelle, and Igor, for your wonderful presentations. Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I think we are all willing to wrap around and help. Um, I appreciate the questions. They were thoughtful questions. I think they are very in touch with the realities of trying to launch a system like this. You know, the other thing I would say is, Pick something that's doable. You know, when we do our trainings, we talk about pick a low hanging fruit that you can do to demonstrate that it works and to start having these systems coordinate together. Sometimes you might not, you may have a team of stakeholders and they've never met each other. They don't know how to work together. There's just so much to work out. Once you have that multi system approach worked out, then you can expand it, you can scale it, you can move it to other parts of the country. So um, think big, have some stretch goals that will be hard, that will keep you motivated, but start small, do something. Um, it's not going to be perfect at first, but do something and roll up your sleeves. And, and I hope we've provided enough information and you know the incentive to make that happen. Igor? Uh, folks, we, we, are, we are here to help. So we are your resource. Uh, the, uh, so the, you, you don't need to start from completely from scratch because th th there are people with some experience in, in, in this area, so just ask. Uh, we are simply one email away from you or one for phone call away from you. This, this is pretty easy. Uh, the COVID situation will get better and will improve. There is no such a thing like permanent crisis. Every crisis, crisis is temporary. This one is temporary too, it will go away. And hopefully next time we have this opportunity to chat, we'll do it in person. And then it might be even more impactful than even, even this session. Uh, so just let's rely on each other and you will succeed without questions. Thank you, thank you, Igor. Uh, on that positive note, uh, I am concluding this. Uh, so. 
thank you everybody thank you to the dear audience who have taken out major chunks of their time uh to to be a part of this conversation which is very important i think uh for everybody out there uh thank you of course melody igor and michelle without you all this wouldn't have been possible uh your insights have definitely uh people have taken notes i can say that for sure <laughs> and uh, and of course uh, the entire icep global team uh, ola olivia and livia thank you so much and uh, before we end uh, that uh, we this webinar is available so in case you all want to revisit this conversation you can go to the youtube page and you can also go to the icep website and you'll be able to find it and apart from that in the month of may we have a lot of sessions coming on on tobacco uh where you will be having more insightful conversations such as these and uh, do definitely check out the entire events page at icep uh, website uh thank you everybody thank you so much and uh, this is me satyabhan singh from icep india bye bye, bye, -bye. stay safe and healthy